Good morning, and once again, Merry Christmas. If you will, open your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29, and in just a moment we'll read the first 14 verses of Jeremiah uh, chapter 29. Christmas is the ultimate expression of the character, the attributes, the will, the purpose, and the plan of God. Because so much of our time, our energy, is spent on the peripheral issues of the seasons. That is, we fret and obsess over the gifts and the food and the travel and so many other details, even believers, forget the one whom we celebrate. During the months of COVID, I often asked you to draw the curtains on the challenges of that particular season. In a similar way, I ask you today to draw the curtain, whether that curtain separates you from the legitimate pleasures of family and friends as we gather for this season, or whether the curtain separates you from the sorrows of loss, the disappointment, or the frustrations that are so easily a part of the season. I say, draw the curtain. Let us enter into worship. Let us worship the one Jeremiah looked forward to. Let us worship the one who has come. He has lived. He has died. He has been raised. He has ascended. He rules and reigns. And until that day that we anticipate the day of his return. So as Jeremiah lived in a devastatingly uncertain world, yet he lived with hope. He promised a righteous king and a glorious new covenant, which has now been fulfilled in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us live in light of those realities. Let us live with confidence, with certainty, and with joy between the two advents of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Read with me. These are the words that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles, to the priests, to the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shephon, and Gemariah, the son of Hukiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Pray with me. Father, once again, we thank you for the privilege 
of gathering as your people, gathering in your house, gathering for your purpose. Lord, we thank you for the testimony of Christmas. And Lord, we ask forgiveness for how easily we lose sight of the real issues, of the real reason that we celebrate. We thank you for the sending of your Son, for his purpose, for his accomplishment, for the work that he accomplished at Calvary, for his ongoing work for us, that he intercedes for us, and for the reality that as he rules and reigns, he awaits the day of his triumphal return as we await that day. Bless us this day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeremiah, of course, was one of the Old Testament prophets. They uh, were saddled with, which, uh, with what which was ultimately unpleasant duty, having to say to their uh, fellow citizens of Israel that the wrath of God was going to come, and it was going to come soon, and it was going to be devastating. And they spoke out against the evils of the day, and they called the nation to repentance. A repentance, really, that never fully came. And a judgment was finally given to them. The context here, for those of you that know your Old Testament history, is around the year 600 A.D., King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came and was the instrument of God's judgment upon the nation of Israel. And there were three successive deportations to the land of Babylon. It is likely that the prophet Daniel and his three friends were taken out of Jerusalem around 605 B.C. Uh, this letter was probably written a few years later, around 598, when there was a second incursion and deportation. And then finally, uh, the temple would be destroyed in 586 B.C. by the Babylonian army. And so the days for Jeremiah were difficult. He is often remembered as the weeping prophet, as he grieved over the sin of his people and held forth the hope that was on the other side of repentance. And while assuredly, there was a message for that day, both in terms of grace and forgiveness, but also a message of discipline and judgment. There was also on the horizon a future and a final and an ultimate hope. And that is in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, a righteous king that he spoke of, one that would inaugurate a new and a perfect covenant with the people of God. So let's look today into chapter 29. Again, this is a letter that Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to those uh, living in exile in Babylon. And so he tells us a bit of the exile's uh, situation there. Evidently, uh, some of the leaders of uh, the nation had survived, the, the elders and the priests and the prophets. Uh, they were now living there in Babylon. And we are told that this was after the deportation of King Jeconiah, who was taken to Babylon and other officials within uh, the court of Israel. In the study of this text this week, I went back and reviewed the historical books, particularly uh, the last chapters of 2 Kings and of uh, 2 Chronicles. And it is a tragic story of what happened to this nation. And all of this devastation came upon them just a few years after the great hope of revival, the great hope of repentance had taken at least a foothold in the nation during the reign of a king we remember as Josiah, as the temple scrolls were recovered, and again, that people repented of their sins. But again, within four years, the nation relapses 
into their apostasy, into their wickedness, into their evil. And God does exactly what He said He would do. He would utilize a nation that's described as far more wicked than Israel, for far, far more cruel than the nation of Israel, but they would be the rod of His instrument, the rod of His wrath that He would provoke and bring upon this nation, His chosen people, for a particular purpose. And while in some sense the Babylonian captivity didn't solve every problem that Israel had, History tells us it did resolve one problem. They never lapsed into idolatry again. That, didn't, that doesn't mean they were um, uh, faithful to God, but it cured them of their tendency uh, to be uh, absorbed into the worship of other nations and to worship idols. And so we find beginning in verse 4, instructions for the exiles. And Anytime I, I see this or I see the, the language of exile, I'm reminded of how Peter opens his first epistle. Speaking to the church, he describes us as exiles. That, that is, by definition, the people of God have been and always will be strangers in a strange land. This is ultimately not our home. And by definition, we simply do not fit into the world system. And as we read this, just what we know about warfare and enemies and uh, even what we might know from uh, the biblical examples, verse 4 is quite unusual in that it seems like he's, he's calling upon the nation to compromise, to capitulate, to, to surrender to this pagan enemy. But he's saying God has a unique and a particular plan for this nation. And the punishment is sure, and it is severe, and you're going to submit to this captivity, to this punishment. And so in verse 4 and verse 5, we see instructions that simply say to those in the, to, in the exile in Babylon that they are to flourish. And notice there in verse 4, just kind of as an aside, it says, I, who's the I? God. I have sent you. That is, these evil people invaded, and they did evil things, and they were a terrible and wicked people, and yet a sovereign God utilized these wicked people as the instrument by which He would accomplish a holy purpose, mainly to discipline His people. And I find it all too frequent among the people of God uh, of today. Good things, oh, that's a God thing. Bad things, oh, that's the devil. Now, I don't want to discount the devil. But let me always remember that the devil is God's devil. He can only go as far as God allows him to go. And so we often try too hard to protect the character of God. We try to defend him. And yet here, this great evil, God says, I have sent you there for my purpose. And then the instructions, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat their produce, move forward with life in this foreign land. In fact, look at verse 6, be fruitful. Very closely reflective of the creation mandate, that is to get married, have children as a, as a product of that marriage, and don't decrease. Really, for the entirety of my life, I have heard believers even say something I just cannot imagine bringing children or more children into the world. It's such a difficult place. It's such a terrible place, and it is. But I believe the creation mandate, and I believe what the principle that is defined here is to, for God's people to rejoice in multiplying, to rejoice in bringing children into the world, even in a world that is as difficult as ours is. And then he says to them, look at verse 7, that they are to be involved, so involved, look there, seek the welfare of the city. 
kind of one of my favorite concepts over the last 20, 25 years is what Jesus refers to in the Sermon on the Mount, that you are the salt of the world, the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. Two concepts. You are, you are to expose the darkness of the current generation. You are to be a curative. You, you are to be that which inhibits the, the uh, uh, corruption that goes on in the world as you live and as you work and as you speak uh, the truth of the gospel. Now, we have to be, be very careful, like, a, like many things that we've touched on lately. This is not go become so integrated and assimilated into the world that there is no distinction between what you believe and what you do and what the world believes and what they do, okay? That, that is, we're, we're not to go along to get along in the world. But we are to step into the world knowing the Word of God and proclaiming the Word of God. We've come back to this so many times in the last three or four years. I'll simply say it this way. I'm right. Isn't that a great thing? If you have a takeaway from the sermon today, that's it, okay? What do you mean, Tim? When I rightly divide the Word of God, as it applies kind of specifically to life in the church, to your individual life, or how we go into the world. If the Bible defines something as evil, it is evil, and we speak out against it, and we stand against it. And if the Bible defines something as right or righteous, we speak of it and we demand it. And that is what is good for the city. That is how we seek the welfare of the city. We don't go along with every idiotic idea the city has. In fact, we tell them, that's stupid, that's idiotic. Amen? Okay, yeah. I mean, this stuff that's coming up never has worked, never will work. We're, that is good for their welfare. That is good for flourishing, for doing well in the world. And so is salt and light. We seek the welfare. And as always, God's people have always been assaulted with liars. That's always been a problem. There's always been the prophet problem of false prophets. There were those that were working among the exiles in Babylon, and they were saying, this is not going to last that long. Don't, don't, don't get a house. Don't plant a field. You know, don't, don't give and uh, receive in marriage. This isn't going to be long. And Jeremiah says, no, 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 no. They're lying. God has not sent them, and that is not God's message. And you need to understand, this is going to last 70 years. That, that's, many of you are going to die there. But there is a promise of hope for the future. And so, go to where I have sent you. Be productive, be fruitful, be involved. Do not be deceived. Listen with a discerning ear. Listen discriminatingly so that you do not embrace their errors. And so we see there now in verse 10 the, the promise of the exiles and their restoration. Look at verse 10. Seventy years, I will visit you. Sometimes this comes up. Somebody, in fact, somebody kind of made an allusion to it recently. Well, God showed up and God showed out or something like that. And I'm not real crazy about that, okay, just so you know. It's not as bad as I'm just waiting on, for the rapture or I'm just going to ask Jesus in my heart. It's not, not that bad, but, but it's up there. Because guess what? God is present everywhere. The distinction is what? Whether he is present to bless or whether he is present to oppress. But God is present in all places and all things at all times. He is going to visit them, uh, to bless them, to, to bring them back uh, to the land. I'm going to fulfill my promise to bring you back, that, that this covenant I made so long ago with Abraham is still in effect, and I'm going to give you back, bring you back, and I'm going to give you this land. Verse 11, I'm going to give you a future. I, I know the plans I have for you. Now, probably one of the most quoted T-shirt, bumper sticker type verses in the Bible. 
And, and to be sure, it is consistent with Genesis 45, 6 and, and Genesis 50, 20. Hey, you, you guys, Joseph's brothers, you're jerks, you're lowlifes, you meant to do harm, you're terrible people, but God transcended everything, what you meant for evil. God has worked it for good in the saving of many lives. You meant to harm me. And God used it to save many lives. Just like Romans 8, 28 and following. Yes, God works in everything for the good of those who love Him. Those who have been called according to purpose. That doesn't mean God works to make your circumstances pleasant or you superficially happy. It means in the overarching tapestry from eternity past to eternity future, that what God orchestrates, defines, decides for your life is for your ultimate good. Now, what is your ultimate good? You have, well, it's, it's, it's that I have a bigger house and a nicer car and more disposable income, and, and my 401K keeps going up. Now, the ultimate good it is that even in this life, even in this fallen world, you would have a sense of the glory of God and that you live to the day that you will see His face and you will be satisfied forever. There's two things about pleasure in this life. And one of them is all pleasure is a foretaste to the ultimate pleasure of God. That is, you can legitimately enjoy the pleasures of this life, and you should. I encourage you to. And yet, all pleasure in this life is temporary. It, it, it is, at some level, uh, incomplete. And it reminds us of our hope of a perfect pleasure in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, God did bring them back. They, they, they were called back to the land, verse 12, and at some level they, they sought Him and they, they, found he, they found Him at some level. But I would, I would call the return from the exile partial, temporary, tentative, at the end of the day, disappointing. The temple, as described in both Ezra and Haggai, wasn't that glorious. It didn't have the ark. There was no Shekinah glory. And the people were still compromised, lackadaisical in their devotion to God. And their independence as a, a state would be very short-lived. They, they really, other than their strategic location as a land bridge, from Europe and Asia to Africa and Egypt, they didn't amount to much on the world scene. They were never great. But God did restore them. They did come back, and it was a great thing. But within 200 years, the one we remember as Alexander the Great came and conquered them. 300 years after that, the Romans would come and conquer them. And they would be subject to the rulers of Rome even when the king did come. When, this, when I believe this promise of plans that are good for welfare, for not evil, that the ultimate fulfillment is really not going back to Jerusalem, which was a good thing. It was a blessed thing. But the greater thing, the ultimate thing, was the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was their ultimate welfare, and it is our ultimate welfare. That when the Lord Jesus Christ came, when He was conceived within the womb of the Virgin Mary, when the very mystery of God was formed as a man in the womb, it was in fulfillment of the promises that began all the way back in the Garden of Eden that the seed of the woman would crush the seed of the serpent, that the one promised to Abraham would be a blessing to all the nations, that David would have a righteous son who would be a perfect king. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, the good plans of God for us were completed 
in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have read some of the more familiar Christmas passages, and sometimes at, at Christmas, maybe the ultimate Christmas passage gets neglected. How did God fulfill His promise of good? Well, it's described in the Gospel of John chapter 1. You can turn there if you want to. I'm going to read this incredibly theologically complex, difficult description of how the triune Godhead, namely in the, in the second person of that Godhead, is joined to humanity. For the sake of the glory of God, for the sake of the redemption of God's people, for the sake of us knowing the glory of God, for the sake of God fulfilling His promises made so long ago. The Gospel writer John wrote in this fashion, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through Him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came into his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he, got the right, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word, that which was eternal, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Because the Word became flesh, because God became incarnate, there is a hope. There is a present hope, and there is a future hope for the people of God. And it is the person and the accomplished work of our Savior, the Word that became flesh on that first Christmas. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the truth of Christmas. The truth regarding the fulfillment of a plan, of a design, of a purpose. Namely, in truly redeeming your people. Not moving us about geographically, but calling us to yourself through your Son, Jesus Christ. And oh, how we are so guilty. We get so busy, so overwhelmed at this time of year that we forget this tremendous reality that the Word became flesh and dwelled among us and we beheld His glory. May we, in some sense, even here today, have an abiding appreciation of the One whose glory was seen, who was full of grace and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.